Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're chatting about adopt, adoptive and foster care services with special guests. Rebecca Luviao, Executive Director of the National Foster Youth Institute in California. Roy Ross, Founder and President and CEO of Foster Adopt Connect in Missouri. And Rita Sorenen, President CEO of the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption in Ohio. So thank you all for joining us. I'm so glad that you're here. Uh, we have uh, over 400,000 children, youth in foster care, and about uh, 120,000 are, are uh, waiting for adoption. So we have here just a great resource to talk about the whole uh, situation. And we'll, we'll start off uh, with you, Rebecca. Uh, could we talk a little bit about the state of, of affairs in this country uh, surrounding uh, children and youth in need and how we are responding in terms of the foster care system on the one hand and the adoptive services uh, landscape on the other? Yeah, great. Thank you for having me. Um, well, there are far more children in foster care than necessary, and we know that. Um, there are also millions of former foster youth or, or newly aged out youth that continue to negatively suffer from the impact of the child welfare system. The majority of children in foster care, um, over 60% are placed in foster care due to neglect. So one of the things, if we really consider how poverty and substance abuse plays a role on child welfare, um, is huge and substantial, right? So I think, you know, one thing that I often gets left out of these conversations is how are we addressing poverty um, and support systems? But I think um, one of the things that we need to do, and, and we've seen um, drastic increases in child welfare with the opioid epidemic, with COVID. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, the foster care system is not seeming to decrease. It's increasing in the last few years. Um, I think what we really need to be talking about as well is how do we empower social workers to be creative when assisting families? How do we better understand um, and, and provide training around what is and uh, neglect, right? I mean, I think one of the issues that we face is that neglect is um, not really defined in a legal sense. It's, it's, you know, minimum basic sufficiency is sort of what the social worker views as their idea of minimum basic sufficiency in a home. Um, and I also believe that social workers should be educated about how I'm our implicit sure biases um, uh, impact the work that they do with communities and families. Um, there needs to be better support for kinship care. How do we get young people out of group homes, out of foster homes and into family settings, um, grandma, aunts, uncles, cousins, and other family. And we re definitely need better support and less bureaucracy for both foster parents and potential adoptive parents. Um, there's always going to be a need for some children to be placed in foster care um, and who need to be adopted um, for their safety and well-being. However, we, you know, it's far too often that we see these placements as a successful ending. We often adopt children and then that's it, right? And I think what we should really see um, is that it is a major but not final step to ensuring the long-term well-being of a child. And we do this by supporting families in the long-term, including adoptive families. Um, I was a social worker, a child welfare social worker for two years. And I would see a lot of young people on my caseload that had what we would call a failed adoption, right? And I think often about how would that adoption had been more successful if we would have been able to go in and provide additional support and guidance to those families. And also ensuring that adoptive children are able to have relationships with their biological family and extended relatives like grandparents and siblings, um, cousins, aunts and uncles is really vital to the well-being of, of families. You know, I've been working on these issues for uh, over 30 years, and it, it and the, this litany of, of problems um, had, we could have talked about that 30 years ago and 20 years ago and 10 years ago and five years ago. And my concern is that in another 30 years, we're going to be talking about this same litany of problems. It seems to me that, the, that there's a really big correlation between uh, stress on a family, whether it's stress from po poverty or stress from being um, uh, uh, self-medicating. And, and it seems that, that we have a systemic issue, uh, uh, Lori. Uh, how do you see it 
from your perch in uh, Missouri. How do you see the, the, the issue that we're all facing and, and how do we resolve it? Because it is very important that we respond immediately to a need of an individual child, but we need to create a better situation here. Yeah, I 100% agree with everything that Rebecca just said. Um, and your the substance use disorder, uh, mental health crisis, poverty-induced uh, number of kids that are in care as a result of neglect is, um, is probably an area that we need to give additional focus to. Um, I think we have had some efforts around prevention of the need for foster care and adoption over the last several years. There definitely was a federal push to uh, to try to solve that problem by an influx of dollars into states to do some evidence-based programming around preventing kids from uh, needing to come into care. But in reality, um, those, those big issues, those big scary issues like poverty and substance use disorder and adequate mental health treatment are, are things that are prevalent throughout the entire country and probably the world. Um, honestly, the the issues are are so big that it is very difficult for any one system to get a grasp on how to handle them correctly. And the child welfare system is exactly that. It's just a system functioning in the larger scope of the way society works. Some people have some of those issues and function well enough to get by without the attention of child welfare. Um, a lot of people have those issues and um, it sinks them basically to a level low enough to draw the attention of child welfare and those kids then end up coming into care. And I would say uh, I would agree with Rebecca many, many times needlessly. Um, we don't do nearly enough to uh, address those issues with children when they are in their families when they're in the home. Um, we come into a crisis situation at the back end jump in, swoop in to save children, and we have not done any of the work that would have been effective in trying to get that family to stability. And oftentimes, unfortunately, it comes down to money. Um, where are our priorities as a country? What do we prioritize spending our dollars on? We see right now there's a huge debate at the federal level around um, what's infrastructure and what's not. And honestly, um, the child welfare system could could be uh, diminished in a significant way by a huge investment in uh, the issues that cause these, these kinds of problems. Can we get families into effective substance use treatment? Can we provide adequate mental health services? If a family finds itself homeless, can we get them into a house? Can we help people with transportation? It's basic stuff. It comes down to, are we as proactively pro-family as, as we like to say, or is, is uh, being pro-family uh, just part of a political talking point? And then you have, have the downstream effects where the best, the best solution is adoption um, and is, is fine. Uh, Rita, could you talk a little bit about the, the state of adoption here in the United States? Sure. And thank you both to Lori and Rebecca. They've stated brilliantly that, you know, the front end, what do we do to keep kids from coming into the system? But for, for the 122,000 children right now who have already been freed for adoption, parental rights have been terminated. We've got to make sure that we stay focused on those children as well. We know what happens when children age out of foster care, 20,000 children year over year over year age out of foster care. And not because they're bad kids, but because they don't have that safety net of family, their, their well-being outcomes are compromised. Everything from a higher risk of homelessness to unemployment, to being under undereducated, to early parenting, substance abuse, all those negative impacts that if they had the safety net of family surrounding them would be reduced. And so we're really focused on those older youth, teens in foster care, um, sibling groups, children with special needs, children, sadly, this is what keeps me up every night, who have been in care for so long, moved so many times. Um, have had such layers of trauma in their life that they resist efforts at permanency and they tell a judge, no, thank you, I don't choose to be adopted. The judge listens to that and then they age out of care. We can apply all kinds of resources to kids aging out of care, but the reality is those resources do not provide an adequate substitute for long-term family. The need for family doesn't end at 18. And so that singular focus for us, that's our mission is a singular focus to make sure that those children who have been freed for adoption have every quick and effective opportunity for a permanent 
legal family um, that they can then grow and thrive for the rest of their lives as well. Uh, Rita, staying with you, could you talk about the different age cohorts that, of, of young people entering adoption and some of the different um, challenges that these different age cohorts uh, 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 have? Because you made this really important point that, that it's really worth uh, going into. As, as young people age, right, you have trauma heaped onto trauma heaped onto trauma, and there is a requirement if we're not going to end up building into American society a uh, transgenerational underclass that we at some point address this and provide not only the, the youth and, and uh, the children and youth with support, but also the, the, the families, the, the parents, um, uh, whether, they, whether, whether this is within the context of the birth family or an adoptive family with appropriate support. Could you just talk about those different age cohorts and the different needs that they have? Sure. And, and there's still a tendency in this country when you say the word adoption that people think infant adoption because of international adoption, domestic infant. And indeed, there are infants in foster care, of course, and infants part of sibling groups. But the reality is the average age of a child waiting to be adopted in foster care today hovers around eight or nine. We know from research that the day a child turns nine in foster care and they have been freed for adoption, their likelihood of being adopted decreases significantly. So we have these myths and misperceptions, first of all, that surround older youth. Well, they couldn't fit into my family, they're already fully formed, right? That we would say that about an eight-year-old or a nine-year-old. Well, I, I couldn't handle the trauma they've experienced. I don't know what to do. Um, and the misperception that it is um, sexual abuse or physical abuse that, that puts kids into care when, as has already been noted, the majority of kids are there because of issues that we probably could have addressed at the front end. So we've got to be able to remember that, look, we're all homing pigeons at heart, right? Uh, a 15-year-old wants to stay connected to their family of origin no matter what circumstances they've come out of. That's, that's where we identify. And so we have to provide adoptive families that kind of support and education so that they can understand that extended kin is appropriate for these children if they're safe, that they should be first placed with kin and then move down that ladder of available families if kin is not available or safe to them. It's helping families understand um, what the needs of the children are um, rather than um, this predominance of, of uh, trying to understand what the needs of the family is, right? If first, let's understand the needs of the child, then let's work with the family to accommodate those needs, particularly older youth and the needs that they have for recognition, for identity, for dealing with layers of trauma, for post-adoption support. I mean, Rebecca said it, said it brilliantly. Uh, Adoption is just a comma in this sentence in child welfare. It's not the exclamation point. And we've got to make sure that resources, services, and networking connections are available to families. You know, as we look around the country, we see individual states having slightly different approaches to, uh, to, to foster care, to intervention, protective uh, services, and then adoption. And then we also see um, a network of federal laws that interact with the state and local laws. We also have this, this issue of uh, urban centers have different requirements than uh, rural areas. Uh, can we just talk a little bit about uh, how you see this, uh, Rebecca, in terms of creating a rational approach that um, that honors local control and local si- local situations, but also does not uh, differentiate um, young people based on where they happen to be born and provide some sort of a, a level set that is an American approach to an irrational approach to foster care while also honoring these sort of local Um, local requirements? Yeah, that's a great question. And I know it's something that like um, NFYI has conversations with federal um, legislators about on on multitude of topics. Adoption is, is one of those, right? That you look at the disparities between services and access to, um, to resources greatly, greatly vary depending on your County, your city, right? Your state, And so I know our members have really been pushing for more uh, without taking away the state's right to choose more of a conversation and that you're pulling states and counties involved to say we need to have a baseline understanding and agreement that these are the basic rights of children and families. Right. I think several states have, you know, a child's um, 
foster care bill of rights, but I don't think there's one at the federal level um, that really says like, here's what children are allowed to do. And I think, I think families um, can get complicated. You know, there are young people who are born in California and maybe they have a sibling that was born in another state and they're in two different states, foster care systems, and it can become really challenging to create permanency and all of that. But I think the first step is to have a conversation with these states on board and come up with a with a consensus together that involves adoptive parents, alumni of care, current you know constituents of the child welfare, along with the policymakers at a federal state level, to say what is the basic thing that we can agree on and where where is it fair for people to get creative because you're rural or your city, but ch- but all children whether they grow up in a rural or an urban environment have the right to have access to community and family and. Um, and resources that will that will meet their basic needs. And I'm not just talking about housing and clothing, right? But their basic emotional needs um, is really, really crucial. And that should not vary depending on where they live. Lori, care to comment? Yeah, um, we are in the process of opening a, a post-adoption resource center in Macon, Missouri. Tiny little town, mid-Missouri, north uh, not, not much around. And um, visiting with our local partners there at the Children's Division as we're getting ready to gear up and open this, one of the things that they mentioned was that there are two, two therapists in the town. And those two therapists are the only people that are available for their circuit, their judicial circuit, to refer kids to, parents to, anybody who needs mental health services to. So typically, a stream of services is maybe two visits. And after that two visits, that's it. That's all that they can get with that, with that clinician. And for anyone that's ever done any work with uh, parents who have these issues or kids who've, who've experienced this trauma, they haven't even scratched the surface in two visits. Um, so one of the things that I would say is a major barrier, and you know, no matter uh, what, where we look in Missouri or Kansas where we provide services, is that rural areas have very limited access to the services that are necessary to support families. So in general, the families the kids are born into, and then obviously foster and then adoptive families on the backside of that. Um, So one of our biggest goals is to get our services out into those rural communities and expand their access through any means we can come up with telehealth, um, any other kinds of uh, post-placement supports um, and and prevention services to families in those communities. If you can't access uh, substance abuse treatment and the, and the local judge is requiring that you complete substance abuse treatment before you can even visit your child in foster care, and they can do that because they're the judge, doesn't matter what best practice says or what children's division policy is, um, you're kind of, you know, you're you're going to lose your kid if, because you don't have access to transportation to take you an hour and a half to the next big city where you might be able to access that treatment. You know, I, I hesitate to get involved in in the politics here because I I believe that you know when it comes to kids, we should all be unified. We are all unified. We really all want the best for kids. But you, you've all referred a number of times to this idea of, of resource um, uh, and whether it's in rural areas or um, we're talking about, um, at, uh, about various resources required to reduce trauma on families. Um, are, are, are we at a point here where, um, you know, famously we uh, invest in rural electrification for businesses? But we're not necessarily investing, as you say, Lori, in in um, in support for families in rural areas. Are we at the point right now where, in order to uh, shift the realities for uh, kids who are marginalized, that we that we really have to start thinking uh, very practically from the child's point of view, and not necessarily from you know, if you look at Dave Thomas's uh, whole uh, c- career arc, right? Business guy, um, uh, entrepreneur, uh, empresario, um, also a person who who came from looking at at a problem, but from a child's point of view. I mean, his whole business is built from a child's point of view as well. Um, is, is this what we need to do? We need to start thinking less as adults and more as the children. 
Absolutely. And, and if you don't mind my stepping in, absolutely. And we've learned so much from first Dave Thomas, who came from very humble beginnings um, and created not only an incredible business brand, but the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. But what we've also learned from that is sort of a franchised consistent approach, right? And that's that's what's behind one of our signature programs, the child focused recruitment model that's now an evidence-based model that we're taking to scale in states that addresses that very issue that you brought up is the complexity and the inconsistency from from federal to state to county to region to agency that exists in the child welfare system when we can scale and, and, and do co-investment relationships with states, public-private partnerships, and say every child in your state, whether they're in Franklin County or Tuscarawas County in Ohio, should get the same consistent evidence-based service and the same aggressive service to assure an adoptive home. And so we're doing that now in 13 states, nine more states in, in negotiation. That's one way in looking at these issues and looking at the problems of how do we in an inconsistent country where things are inconsistently applied based on, on socioeconomic status or region, we can apply something consistent and make it an equitable um, playing field for children and absolutely looking at it from the eyes of the children and the children's need and a child focused approach. I could add to that. I think the other thing that really stands out for me um, is that oftentimes we approach things from a, a, li a liability issue, right? Like you'll often hear states or the federal government or counties will say, oh, we can't do that because, you know, we'll be liable if something goes wrong. And that perspective is not centering children and family, right? Every parent has um, risk factors that you take every day that you make decisions that, you know, um, allow your child to explore the world a little bit. And it might end up that they fall down and get hurt. Right. But we still take that risk where I think child welfare is so risk averse that it ends up creating more damage and more harm because we're not actually thinking not only through the eyes of the child, but what's in the best interest of the child that may put us a little bit more you know, at risk for something legally to go wrong um, in a common sense way. Right. Um, it, it, that's that I, I wanted to add that because I think that's that's something that I see a lot that happens in policy is that we become so risk averse that we just take out what's in the best interest of children and families. I, I wanted to uh, to pose a question uh, to you all. One of the things that, that really strikes me is that if you take a look, if you're involved in, you know, elbow deep in the direct services uh, approaches, what you see is a tremendous diversity amongst staff, amongst the caseworkers, amongst the, the, uh, the uh, people who provide a whole range of services, whether they're attorneys, uh, law enforcement, um, caseworkers, um, clinicians and so on and so forth. Then when you get up into the higher management ranks, it becomes wider and wider and wider and wider. Um, how do we shift the sensibility surrounding the provision of services by changing um, the, uh, the architecture of management, the deciders, also the legislators who are more connected and more diverse and more intimately involved with the communities that are served We've, we got a question from one of our longtime viewers saying it's this all seems so overwhelming. What can communities do? And part of the the issue is communities need to be involved and the fullness of those communities need to be involved in all levels. But I spend a lot of time speaking, you know, as as we are here, we have we have four windows. We're all white. We have three women and, and one one man who is the interviewer. So so the professionals amongst you uh, are are. Of, of a particular, uh, come from a particular uh, perspective, how do we ensure that leadership across the board, whether it's legal or legislative or direct services uh, or management, that, that, that we really are reflecting the youth who are being served? Uh, Lori, what, what do you think about, about this whole uh, issue and how do we change? Um, I think it's critically important and um, actually the basis for the organization that I run um, which is an organization that started grassroots founded by foster and adoptive families to support foster and adoptive families. In the same way, we've incorporated uh, the, the youth, the alumni um, into, our, into our programming. We have a program currently that serves young people between the ages of 17 and 26 who have aged out of foster care, fully staffed by foster care alumni. 
Um, And so one of the things that we need to do is consciously make an effort in every in every avenue to include the voices of the real life kids and families that are being served in all of our levels of decision making. Um, Forty percent of the staff in my organization have a personal connection to foster care and adoption. Um, I think that's critically important in general because if we lose our connection to that front line, if we lose our connection to the reality of the experience on a day-to-day basis, then we glaze over the real issues that we're facing. Um, we can't address trends. And, and I really think everybody in this country is beginning to recognize the importance and an awareness of the need to, um, to make sure that those folks who are decision makers are people who are representative of the young people who come into care. I think there's some innovative work going on around um, disparity, uh, racial disparity in foster care that needs to be spread throughout the country. And um, and I have found it's really effective in doing advocacy in the states where I operate when there are folks in the legislature that have some personal connection. And it, it's interesting because that personal connection used to always be someone who was an adoptive parent or adopted from foster care. But we have a speaker of the house in the state of Missouri who is a former foster youth himself. And having that person in a, in a position of authority in that level within our legislature has led to a tremendous difference in terms of the approach to dealing with issues related to foster care and adoption. And it isn't, it's, it isn't a partisan issue, honestly. It's something that everyone can get behind. Uh, I just want to, to before, we, before we go uh, to you, Rebecca, I just wanted to uh, share some of the results of, uh, of the poll. We, we asked uh, first, what is the single most effective strategy to improve placement stability and outcomes for children? And uh, what was interesting here is that um, uh, 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 placing um, uh, kids with relatives unless it's impossible to do otherwise uh, receive the the uh, the largest number of answer, and then also better workflows, better training, um, uh, uh, more support for case management is what were the other set of answers. Very very interesting. And then um, we also talked about challenges for kids. We asked what what are the top two challenges faced by uh, adopted children, and we had uh, feelings of grief, separation, rejection, loss, guilt. And self-esteem issues, and and um, and the need for for coaching, which, you know, this is really about people coming together in both of these these um, these questions. There's nothing here that we can't overcome by responding as Americans do with with compassion. And if we are family oriented, we can do this stuff. Uh, Rebecca, I'm sorry for for uh, for jumping in. Uh, you wanted to to make a point. Yeah, I wanted to agree with Lori and add to her point that I think at NFYI, I'm a former foster youth. 75% of our staff are former foster youth. I think the first step is that you have to be very intentional and aware. But in addition to that, you have to create um, conversations that we have internally is how do you also create organizations that are trauma-informed to their staff and that are creating pipelines of leadership, right? So how are we investing in former foster youth or constituents of child welfare and allowing flexibility in their schedules to attend school? Are we putting them through management training and leadership training opportunities so that they can move through those ranks? So often I see, like, as you pointed out, that the that the constituents of child welfare that work for the counties are usually in entry level positions. But it should be the county's responsibility to create pathways of leadership programs that are prioritizing people of color and former foster youth and biological parents and constituents of child welfare to move them into places and positions of of power and decision making. Right. So if you don't have opportunities to be able to go to college, you're not going to ever be able to be a competitive um, interviewer next to someone with a master's degree in social work unless your organization is willing to invest in their staff and their employees and they're cognizant of the disparities that these populations um, have to face and why they're not maybe the most qualified on paper, right? But the lived experience that you have um, 
is is hardly ever accounted for. And oftentimes I have found as a former foster youth in the professional world that sometimes people will say, maybe this is an issue that's too close to you, right? As opposed to saying this issue is close to you and therefore you're an expert in it. And we're going to figure out ways to mitigate, you know, your transference um, in issues that you work with. And we're going to support you through that. And that's a paradigm shift in the way that we work as an organization. That is so important. Lived experience is a competency. It's a professional competency. Rita, uh, you care to weigh, uh, to weigh in here? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and there are so many good movements happening right now, but not enough. Um, uh, if, if you know, too often uh, policies created based on a crisis, right? Look, the Adoption Safe Families Act was created on the, the story of, of kids carting their clothes in trash bags. Absolutely. They shouldn't be doing that. And we should fix that. But where does the youth voice, the lived experience voice, the, the birth parent voice, the, the foster family voice, when is that in included. And if it's not, then let's not move this policy forward until we have made sure that lived experience informs policy that then informs for decades how we operate. Absolutely. I, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and Rebecca said it brilliantly. Rita, we're going to give you the last word. Thank you so much for, for the work that, that you all are doing. And thanks for enlightening us on this, this uh, issue. You know, it, it just seems that we are a country that was built on families and we continue to thrive to the extent that we support our families. Let's all get together and, and provide a little bit more uh, compassion, a little bit more support. We can do it. it, it it's not a, it, it's not a uh, Republican or Democratic or conservative or whatever. It's all, it's all nonsense when it comes right down to it. Today, a child needs help. So let's just get together and help. It's, it's, it's that simple. Rebecca Luvial, Executive Director of the National Foster Youth Institute in California, Lori Ross, founder and president and CEO of Foster Adopt Connect in Missouri, and Rita Sorenen, president and CEO of the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption in Ohio. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us. Thank your staffs, thank your donors, thank your communities, and thank your foster youth and youth who are in adoption where we will all try to do better on their behalf and, and we will all try to honor their knowledge of their situation and try to respond to it as faithfully as we possibly can. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much.